Hello, and welcome to another extra special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. And today we're joined by David McIntyre. Now, David is currently working at a company on the West Coast called Prex, but has experience not all in sales ops um, from companies like Square and Twitter. So we're going to jump into that. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. Really great to be here. Really appreciate it. And so my first question, I'm super interested to understand how you kind of migrated into sales ops, because I know you have a couple of other, I guess, specialities from previous roles. So how did, like, where and how did that happen? Yeah, that's a great question. I kind of took a, a, a definitely a different route than some of my colleagues and some, some of the other people I'm familiar with in sales ops. Um, basically, I started out working in sales. Um, I was working for a, a small company straight out of college in New York, um, ended up getting acquired by Twitter. Um, so I went over there and continued to work in sales. We were doing influencer marketing type of stuff. So getting people to post on on Vine and Instagram for brands. And like back then, that was like revolutionary, uh, <laughs> a revolutionary idea. And so I was selling branded advertising campaigns, essentially. Um, and so, you know, after doing that for a while, I kind of got sick of the advertising industry, ended up going, moving out to San Francisco, working for a couple of, of companies, including Square, um, still doing sales, um, sort of then doing more kind of like traditional tech sales. Um, but I think, you know, to answer your question about how I, I moved into sales ops, um, when I was in sales, especially when I was at Square, I always was a very sort of process-oriented thinker. I really started to feel like, you know, if your system was efficient, if your process was efficient, then every sales activity that you're doing, so whether that be making phone calls or sending emails or doing demos or whatever it is, everything is going to be way more efficient, way easier, you're going to have to work less, um, and you're going to see better results, right? And, and so the other piece of it was that I, you know, having been in sales for, you know, four to five years, um, you know, started to feel like I was kind of like a cog in a really big machine. You know, like I was being asked to do the same thing again and again. Sales is also pretty individualistic. You know, it's not, there's not a ton of room for collaboration, um, or kind of like thinking outside the box. It's like you're being asked to, to do something and do it really well and do it repeatedly. Um, and so for some people, that's amazing. And I really enjoyed that for a long time. But then I kind of started to feel like, you know, I wanted to do something that was more collaborative, more creative, um, and kind of like work on the machine. That's the way that I started to think about it is like, hey, if I can learn about how these systems are set up and how these processes are set up, and I know from experience, you know, what improvements I would make if I was in control, then, um, you know, then it would be a really good fit. I could really do some great things. And, and so when I was at Square, I transitioned from being in sales to being a, a sales ops analyst, um, which was not, you know, exactly the easiest transition to make just because um, it had never been done in the organization before. And so that's something I, I think, you know, when, I, when people ask me about that transition or any career transition, I think, like, if someone has kind of paved the way, it's a little bit easier in your organization. But if not, then you have to be very, very clear and very actually repetitive about like what you want and why you want it and, and where you want to go. And so thankfully, I was able to make that transition. And, and I think, you know, start, starting in sales ops at Square is obviously a ton to learn um, of, of all types of different subjects. And, and I really lean on my experience as a salesperson um, in order to sort of get me started. And now, you know, having been in sales ops for basically two years plus, I you know, know more about different subjects. I, I've gotten more in sort of the strategic and analytical side of sales ops, which I, I, I find really enjoyable. Uh, but yeah, after, after working in sales ops at Square for a while, I, I moved over to Brex, um, which is also a, a fintech company and, and have been there um, for almost a year. Got it. I mean, thanks for the summary. And there's one point that I want to pull out, which I think is super interesting because you're, I've done a few of the, these interviews now. And mm -hmm. obviously, to the person who's great at sales, be is potentially not the most analytical person, right? Sure. They're like, a, like insanely emotionally intelligent. But then <laughs> yeah. when you get somebody who, I guess, has enough emotional intelligence to be good at sales, but then also has the logical analytical side, they make the perfect sales ops person. Yeah. Would, like, Absolutely. would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. And I, I'm reminded of that. Um, there was a colleague that I had um, in sales ops who was a more technically gifted analyst than anyone else on our team um, who, who could do things uh, with Python and in Looker and all of these technical subjects that um, he was just a cut above, right? But he 
wasn't so strong at the area of the job that you're talking about, which is communication and emotional intelligence and prioritization and things like that. And so um, I watched as he wasn't necessarily as effective in, in the sales ops position as he could have been. Um, and so that's something I've heard actually from a lot of people that I've worked with in sales ops and in sales is that technical skills can be learned. Technical skills can be acquired through a mixture of experience and teaching, right? But the contextualization, the communication, the prioritization, the, the part of the job that involves collaboration and other people and, and trying to kind of find a way to find a plan to make things happen, that's actually really, really, really challenging. And obviously, it can be learned as well, but it helps if you have sort of a, a background in, in a job that um, is a little bit more related to that. So yeah, I've, I've found that absolutely. And, and having experience as a salesperson is helpful regardless, you know, because you understand what the perspective is of the person that you're trying to, to help or like the end user. So that's always helpful too. Exactly. You understand the customer. Now, um, to zoom in onto Brex, could you just pull out uh, the, the core of your tech stack? Well, what are you guys using? Um, and what is like, which of those tools do you really love? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, not obviously, but the foundation of it is Salesforce, right? Um, that's the case at most large tech organizations, obviously. Um, and then there's a huge variety of other tools that integrate to some extent with Salesforce. Um, we use Outreach, um, which I we used to use SalesLoft at Square. So different technology, very similar purpose of like a sales engagement platform or a, you know, sort of a task management tool. Um, I really liked Outreach in some ways. I think in other ways, it's, it, there's definitely things that, that could be improved. Um, we also use Troops at Brex, which is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's like sort of like a, a virtual kind of like deal gong. It's like a Slack notification tool for... Uh, for sales, which is it's especially important in a remote world, um, we've recently kind of focused back on that. Is like how do you create that sort of team culture of winning and celebration in a remote world? I think a tool like Troops is is very helpful in that regard. Yeah, I just um, have to give a quick shout out to the CEO of Troops as well. He shared one of our episodes uh, a couple of weeks <laughs> ago because he got mentioned. But carry on. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, I, I I think that's a great example. Of like, I'm sure we'll get into this about how like in the remote world there are things that are a little bit more important than they were before. Um, so we can, we can get onto that. Um, I'm a huge fan of lean data. I don't know uh, if this has been spoken about in the podcast before, but lean data is a tool that plugs into Salesforce that does a lot of routing and matching. And so, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges I've observed in, in my time in sales and sales ops is just like, especially at a company like Square and Brex, where you have thousands and thousands of customers, you know, millions of transactions, big amounts of data. Right? How do you tell that the customer who just signed up is related to the sales opportunity that a salesperson is working? Right? That is a really difficult challenge. And Lean Data is the best platform I've ever seen to handle that. It's not perfect. But in terms of matching and routing, especially in these kind of complex data environments, I, I've never seen anything better. And it, it really, like, we lean on that a lot to. Um, facilitate like business requirements. So for example, if the teams change, if the segments change, if um, that type of thing happens, it's really, really easy to reconfigure lean data versus, you know, building your own custom solution or using some native Salesforce functionality, which, you know, frankly, is probably not going to work as well. Um, so that's another one that I, I, I've really enjoyed working with. Got it. Now let's dig in more into this re remote thing. So Obviously, the team's probably a bit more remote than it previously was. Yep. What have been the, the big challenges for you there? There, you know, there's a multiple of them, as I'm sure everyone has experienced during this time. I think, like most immediately inside of sales ops, I think the biggest challenge was around, or it still is around, prioritization and project management, right? Because when you're in sales ops, you're working. You know, fundamentally, you're working on broken things a lot of the time, right? You're trying to solve problems that are inhibiting people from doing their work, right? And so when you're in an office environment, you are constantly reminded of that because the people that you're serving, the people who are experiencing those issues are right in front of you, right? So they can come up to your desk and they can um, say, hey, what about this problem? Or what about this project? Or how is that going, right? And so that can be really distracting, but it also serves as a reinforcement of the need to make progress quickly and the need to solve problems, you know, as you've committed to. Whereas when you're working remotely, people can't do that anymore, right? So they can ping you on Slack, but that's not, that doesn't have the same effect. And so 
I think what we've really tried to focus on is at the beginning of the quarter, at the beginning of the month, really focusing on what are we going to accomplish, right? How is that going to happen? When is that going to happen? Why is that the mo- why are those the most pressing priorities? And so if something does come up later on, that's going to get in the way of us being able to deliver on those priorities that we agreed to, we can be a lot more explicit with our stakeholders about the trade-offs. I think that that's really, I think that the biggest challenge is like you kind of lose sight of what other people do on a day-to-day basis. And so it's like, hey, someone's going to toss something over the fence to sales ops and they're just going to do it, right? Well, in a remote world, like that's not possible anymore because we have to really, really stick to what we said we were going to do. Um, or if we're going to deviate, we have to make a plan to do that, right? Um, I think like that's, so that's on like the sales ops side. I think on the general sort of sales go-to-market side, I think that it, it's become a lot harder to understand people's processes, um, in, especially in terms of the way that humans can solve the problems that systems create. And what I mean by that is, I, I'm sure everyone listening is familiar, like there are certain things that people at your organization do that are kind of like papering over the cracks. They're like picking up things that are getting lost or they're helping customers who are getting stuck or they're, um, you know, finding the deals that have been lost and going after them, right? Like that type of activity that like someone is, it's always hard for someone in sales ops to understand what th- those people are doing in those scenarios and try to build a process around it. But in this world, it's almost impossible, right? And so because you can't shadow someone, you can't, um, you know, spend the time to have them explain exactly what they're doing you know, in, in great detail. So I think that like just getting as close as possible to the end users and really establishing relationships, you know, that I think that that's something that I've valued since I started working in, in sales ops is like, if you have great relationships with the sales managers and salespeople on your team, then they're going to be able to alert you to some of those things. You're going to be able to ask them, Hey, what is really going on with X, Y, and Z, right? Instead of kind of finding out about it months later, when you realize that you know X number of customers have gone untouched or, or whatever the issue might be, so I think that that type of like understanding people's processes is is much more difficult than it was before, and it's it's very relationship driven. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID nineteen on revenue, and we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. Yeah, let's see some, there's some significant operational changes. It, it kind of sounds like you need to be more strategic about the projects that sales ops are working on. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Cool. And then also some cultural changes in that. Well, not, not changes, but almost some cultural imperatives that actually the team may need to have stronger bonds in order to be as productive when remote. Definitely. Definitely. And like, I, I think for, for senior leadership, right, like are some of the things that I've heard at both at Brex and at other companies is like, they're concerned with, um, you know, what are people doing all day, right? Like, how are they maintaining their productivity? in this remote world, right? And I think like, obviously those questions can be answered just via results, right? So if you're hitting your quota or if you're succeeding and whatever the metrics are, then it doesn't matter, you know, what you were doing all day, right? You're being productive, right? But I think that like the better that people in sales ops have a very firm understanding of like what it actually takes to be an AE, right? Like what does that entail, right? Like how much, you know, just to give a specific example, like how much prospecting does an AE need to do in combination with their job of closing in order to hit their quota, right? If you start to have some of those answers at your fingertips, then number one, it becomes easier to say, to deliver answers. to like, Hey, what are people doing all day? Or is the team productive? But also it becomes easier to to help improve those processes and, and help, you know, take the experiences of your, your reps, your AEs and turn them into something better that is going to help everyone be more productive. Sure. How permanent do you think these changes are going to be? How much of that, those changes that you have made, even if we do go back to more in-person work, I'm not sure if, what your situation is with the break, whether you do plan to do that, but do you think the changes will be permanent or temporary? Um, I think a lot of them will be permanent. 
Um, I think that that's something I've felt since the beginning of the, the pandemic. And, and I think that Brex is in the same situation as a lot of companies, which is that you know, Brex doesn't want to endanger its employees. The outbreak in the United States is quite bad. Um, you know, we're not going to return to a normal office environment for quite a long time. At least that's my opinion. Um, and so like as a result, and even if we did return, this is something I, I, I've talked with a lot of people about, even if some people did return to an office, essentially they are going to be working remotely, right? Because if a big portion of the staff is working remotely, then any, everyone is working remotely, no matter where you are. Right. And so what I've felt is that companies can use this to their advantage. I think Brex is thinking about these things as well as, and and many others, of course, is like, if we're going to have a remote workforce, how can that be, you know, number one, maybe cheaper, but number two, as effective or more effective than being in an office. And so I think that like, and, and of course the way, the way to do that is through systems, right? Through system design and, and system architecture where the, there isn't as much of that papering over the cracks, right? There isn't as much of the need for humans to kind of like use their, their brains to, to fix things, right? It's just that the problem has been solved for them. It's been sort of like extracted away. And that's something I, I think that Brex is certainly thinking about in all aspects of, it, of the company, right? In, in terms of the product, but also in terms of the sales team is how do we make this job as, as not necessarily straightforward as possible, but as efficient as possible, given that we're not, we're not in person, we're not going to be for a long time. And I, I think those changes are, are here to stay because even if we went back to the office tomorrow, right? Like our company has changed. Our systems have changed. We are not just going to let go of some of the efficiency gains and some of the, the progress we've made um, that in some ways was part and parcel of working remotely, right? And so I, I think some of the changes that are driven about by working remotely are here to stay for sure. I, the, you, you mentioned like the big question, which is how can we make remote teams as or if not more productive than in-person yep. teams? That is, that's the big one. Um, awesome. So moving on to forecasting, how... Yep. Like, I assume that's changed. If you can share, like, how has that changed? And then also, what are you doing to try and forecast more accurately? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. I, I, I think people in sales ops struggle with that, no matter what organization you're talking about. Because I think the biggest challenge, you know, for us, especially at Brex, I think, historically, is just that forecasting is, is dependent in some ways on um, human inputted data, right? So things like closed dates and stages and, um, you know, keeping opportunities open when they shouldn't be like that type of thing. Um, and so, you know, when I was at Square, essentially, like one of the approaches taken was, okay, well, um, you know, we know that the pipeline is not, hasn't been kept up in the way that we, you know, it's not perfectly hygienic, right? So that's fine. We are going to, as we project what we're going to, we're going to close, we're just going to do our own analysis, Right, we're going to work with the finance team, and we're going to basically make a determination as to what deals are actually dead but haven't been closed out. For example, right, um, and so I think that that's one method of handling it is just like kind of accepting that things are not as clean as you would want, and then kind of doing an analysis separately so you can deliver an, a, 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 what you hope is an accurate forecast to like the finance team or the leadership team. Right, I think the approach that we've taken at Brex, especially in this remote world, is like really trying to impress upon reps and managers that if they keep their pipelines clean, they will benefit, right? They will be able to make an accurate forecast for their own business. And, you know, what are the things that we can do, you know, in terms of like maybe changing some of the stages, changing some of the automation, delivering better insights to them to help them understand that like, hey, a deal that you have that has been in the same stage for 100 days is very unlikely to close, right? Um, And so, I think that that's kind of the transformation that we've seen is like kind of zooming in on the forecast so that, um, you know, we're delivering, for example, dashboards and tools that allow reps and managers to forecast because then like the laddered up forecast or like the team wide forecast or forecast you would deliver to leadership is more accurate. Um, And so I I think that that kind of goes hand in hand with the remote world, right? Is like if everyone's on their own and they have to kind of manage their own business, like they need to understand why forecasting is important so that they're motivated to take the actions that they need to take. And also we need to make those actions easier, right? So if the product can tell us something about the stage of a customer, then that stage of an opportunity, the related stage of an opportunity should be automated, right? So 
that's, you know, that's really what we've tried to do is take both a people and a systems approach to forecasting to hopefully create better forecasts. Yeah. It's like, how can you incentivize the reps to make the forecast more, uh, Accurate by adding better data to work with. That's like totally. again a massive question. Yeah, it's that's a, that's an age old question, right? Like, and I don't think that that question is ever really going to be perfectly solved. I think a lot of it also depends on how you know to kind of use like a buzzword how transactional your uh, sales organization is. So it's like if you have a company where there's a very long demo cycle and you're you're trying to win over multiple stakeholders, or there's it's a very complex technical product. Which, for example, at Square, you know, for enterprise level deals, that was really the case, right? It would take a really long time. Then, you know, the the only recourse you have really is to lean on your reps to try to push them to like really keep their data updated and and really provide the right information so you can make a forecast. Versus, like, if you have a more transactional environment, faster sales cycle, more product driven, um, kind of like what Square is on the small and medium sized businesses where. An AE's role is really just about closing a lot of businesses and, and moving quickly and staying organized. Then you can use product signals and then you can use perhaps some additional data that you have to make the forecasting and the data hygiene process more, more automated. Got it. Uh, and then on to KPIs. What, what would you say if your, your favorite sales metric to track and has, did that change with the virus? I think that... I don't necessarily think it changed with the virus. I, maybe it just became more important, but I am always a really big fan of conversion rates um, and specifically like funnel conversion rates. So how effective is a salesperson and how effective are teams, et cetera, at taking business that is at the top of the sales funnel and turning that into a customer, right? I think that you know, as, as Brex has evolved and as Square has evolved and, and all these other organizations, there's kind of been a separation of, the, top, the tippy top of the funnel versus the sales funnel, right? So you have marketing maybe and partnerships and sales development and all of these sources of opportunities for, for AEs. And then it's really the AE's job to, and maybe the AE themselves as a source, right? Because they're, they're prospecting. But then the conversion rate from that first step, so whether that be a qualified opportunity or whether that be a sign up from the customer or uh, whatever that first step is, to the last point where the salesperson can control. So for instance, if um, like a deal is lost due to some technical problems or due to credit underwriting or something like that, that's not really in the salesperson's control, but like getting the customer in Brex's case, for example, like submit a full application or sign up or whatever that, that last step is, um, I think is a great way to measure salespeople and measure their effectiveness and measure a lot of different things in one variable right? Not just their sales skills and how are they pitching and how are they, um, you know, talking on the phone, but also um, the, their effectiveness at staying organized, right? Because if you see that a conversion rate, like one of them describing is dropping, then um, what you could infer is that, you know, potentially as you do some more investigation is that the salesperson is letting some deals slip through the cracks, right? They should have converted some business that they ended up not being able to convert for one reason or another. And that's where you can really start to dig in and help them improve. Right. And, and so that's, I, I think anything that can help you measure across salespeople is useful because you can make a comparison, but I think that particularly is helpful because you can really start to help people improve their sales skills and, and not just talking to customers, but like all aspects of the sales job with that metric. Um, Got it. Let me actually move move my position a little bit here because I realize there's this sunlight bar behind my head. Is <laughs> this is a this is a classic working from home problem? It's like <laughs> videos, ch- video conferencing changes, and uh, just give me one second here. I'll come. I'll come uh, mm. swing around. Yeah, I mean it kind of looks like a halo. So <laughs> I think this is going to be a little better. There we go. Um, Makes total sense. So measuring across sales people, but you're also able to drill down to look at specific parts of their performance in order to jump in and help. Um, amazing. Absolutely. And then the final question is, who um, in your sales ops career has inspired or helped you the most? It's a great question. A lot of different people, no question about it. Um, especially when I was at Square, some people who really went out of their way to help me understand things, right? Help me understand Salesforce development. That's not an easy subject. It takes a lot of time and energy to help someone who really doesn't know what they're doing, <laughs> right? Um, and so I have a lot of colleagues there who I, I hope you know are, are great friends and, and assisted me a ton. 
um, so I'll throw some specific names out there, but Zach and Kristen and Bo and Mike Rigg and all these people who were in the management of, of the Brex, uh, sorry, the Square Sales Ops team, who really just helped me get started. Um, I think that now, uh, to answer the question directly, though, I think my, my current uh, manager, Matt Belitsky, um, has been a huge influence on me um, because I think he combines just enormous amounts of knowledge so, you know, how, the, the, answering the question of how with an amazing ability to communicate and work with people. And I think that, you know, that's what we touched on to start the conversation is knowing how is really important. And it's really important to have people around you who can teach you the right ways of doing things or a better way of doing things or reframe your thinking about what solutions you might bring to bear. But equally, if not more important, is how do you communicate that? How do you get people to use this great thing that you've just built? How do you uh, communicate to them the timelines of what you might be doing? I, I think one of, the thing that Matt, one of the things that Matt is really a fan of is iterative development. So treating projects like engineers would treat them and saying, okay, we're going to do a V0, a V1, a V2, a V3, right? We're going to solve the immediate problem and then we're going to build on the solution, right? Um, instead of thinking, oh, you know, and this is something I've fallen victim to, especially earlier in my career, is like, oh man, this problem is so big. How can we ever solve it? Right? Like it's gonna take months and it's gonna, we're gonna have to do X, Y, Z, A, B, and C. Right. And and I think what Matt has impressed upon me is that like that might be the case, but you can start small and you can start by, you know, relieving some of the pain. And then you can move to that bigger and grander solution that you're envisioning. So I think I think he has helped me a lot in just kind of like reframing problems, communicating more effectively, prioritizing more effectively so that, you know, both of us can collaborate on the how and the when, right? Like, and, and what solutions are we specifically going to bring to bear? So um, he, he has a background as a consultant and he's seen a lot of different businesses and a lot of different situations. And I've learned tremendously from that. Shout out to Matt. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. David. So we, we've jumped into, we spoke a lot about systems and how they can make people uh, make, make the remote team even more productive than the in-person team. We've talked about hygienic pipelines, and I've never heard that term before, but I really like it. I'm taking <laughs> Yeah, that. data hygiene is kind of where that comes from, but yeah. Exactly, exactly yeah, but I've, I, I, I'm going to take that forward on this show. And then um, conversion rates. So, yeah. like, it's been it's been an eye opening discussion, and I, I think the core thing that I would like the audience to take away is how can you make the remote team more productive than the team used to be in person? And I think if sales ops people can do that, then they'll become the star of the business almost. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It starts with understanding the sales team, understanding the salesperson, what they're doing on a day to day, and then um, you know working from there. Awesome. David, thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate it, Tom. Thank you.